Welcome to the first talk in the Scientific Computing Training Series presented by Weill Cornell Medicine. I'm Ben Trumbor. I'm a computational scientist at Cornell's Center for Advanced Computing, CAC. We, uh, we are located here in Ithaca and we provide consulting services and system administration and cloud computing to the entire Cornell community. Uh, a lot of the information that you'll hear about today on data transfers uh, can be found at the link at the bottom of this page. At the end of the talk, I'll have another slide showing all of the links that I might mention throughout the talk. Data transfer tools are something that you, I'm, I'm imagining you're interested in using to copy data from one computer to another for your research purposes. Uh, I'm going to begin today by talking about what the different aspects of data transfers may be. And uh, then we'll talk about five different secure data transfer tools. I'm hoping that you'll find that some of these meet your needs in particular. We'll also take a quick look at some graphical user interfaces that can make data transfers easier. And we'll discuss a few tips for making your data transfers faster. My goal for you for this talk is to come away with a familiarity of these five tools, what they can do, and, and, and when you might choose to use one tool rather than, than another based on what you are trying to do, what kind of data you're transferring. So in my view, there are several properties of data transfers that you should consider before you, before you begin uh, performing the, the transfer. Uh, I'm assuming that for most of you, you're interested in moving perhaps some code or uh, data uh, between computers. And, and let's say you take some data from your personal PC and you send it to a research computer that's got a lot of processing power. And then you run some kind of a simulation or experiment with it and generate some output data. And you'll want to copy that data back to your computer. That's that's one example of the type of transfer you might want to make between your personal computer and a research computer. There are also times where you might want to copy data between two different research computers. These are soon to be computers that you don't have a lot of control over. Uh, maybe you, you need to do some post-processing on a different computer or share it with a, a colleague. And a, a third type of data transfer that you may experience is the desire to back up your your data onto a cloud storage platform like Amazon S3. Here you're not really copying it to another computer, you're, you're copying it to a, a storage device. So when you think about the data that you're going to be copying, a couple of things might make one uh, data transfer different from another. And, and one of those is the size of the data that you are uh, trying to copy. Uh, it, the size could be either in the number of files that you're sending or in the, the total gigabytes or terabytes that you hope to transfer. Another uh, characteristic of transfers is whether or not you'll be performing this operation over and over again. If you're only going to do something once, you don't want to spend a lot of time setting up an environment in which to do it. You just want it to be done over, done very quickly. But if you are going to do something many times, then it might be worth uh, spending a little time to set up the very best tool for that purpose. And another type of, uh, another characteristic that relates to data transfers is uh, when you want to keep data in sync in two locations. So syncing means that the, the content of, let's say, a folder in, in each of two locations will be exactly the same. Um, this is uh, something that people do when they're backing data up, but you might also want to do it if you're sharing data with someone or if two people are, are working in the same folders and they want to share each of their contributions with the, with the other part of the team. So when you want to use a, trans, a data transfer tool, there are some requirements. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to install some software or, or check that it is already installed. Uh, the client application is what I'm calling the transfer tool. And this is going to be installed on the computer where you're going to be issuing the commands. 
typically if this computer is, if one of the computers involved in the transfer is your own personal computer, that's going to be where you'll want to run this tool. Uh, but on the other computer that you're transferring to or from, um, there has to be a service there that is prepared to talk to your tool. And as we go through the list of tools, we'll talk about what services are required for each one and, and how likely are, you are to find that they're already in place. Uh, if they aren't in place, you might have to uh, talk to a systems person to, to get that computer up to speed to have the service installed. And it's important to understand that simply having a data transfer tool on your computer does not magically give you the ability to copy data to wherever you want. You, you're going to need to have credentials that would, have let, would let you log in to the, to the other computer, the one that isn't your own. Uh, you have to essentially be able to log into both the computer that's running the tool and the, and the one that is running the service. So this is another situation. If you don't have those credentials or if they're not enabled, you might need to talk to a systems person to, uh, to get them to enable it. I guess I'm trying to gently break the news that there, there will probably be some overhead if you're setting up a situation where you can do uh, data transfers between computers that you do not control. Be prepared for that. Um, systems people understand these requests. They're not going to be, uh, they're not going to stand in your way. You just need to know what you're asking for so that they can understand what you want. So, so uh, once we've got the, uh, the tools in place and the credentials in place, the, the typical workflow would be that you issue commands through a, a client, the data transfer tool, on a computer that I will call the local computer. It's the one you're sitting at. And you'll instruct that tool to connect to uh, the service on the remote com computer. And then you can copy data in either direction. You can put data from your local computer onto the remote remote computer, or you could get data back from the remote computer. It's, it's important to know that you don't need to, uh, you can, it's not like you can only copy from the computer where you're running the tool, and then you would have to go and log on to the other computer so you could copy data back. If you can establish this connection, you can copy data in both directions. So, um, these priorities in this table here are the things I'd like you to th think about when you're trying to decide what tool to use for a particular data transfer. And you may choose, you may have different priorities for different data transfers. And that could lead you to choose a different tool for those different operations. The first item here uh, is security. And security should be a priority for all of us. And I'm going to I'm going to enforce that in this talk by not uh, talking about any tools that are not secure. So uh, if you ever have to go through a hurdle and you're, you're wondering why is this so hard, it's, it's because we want your, your transfers to be secure. The security in this case means um, making sure no one can capture your credentials while they're being communicated between your local computer and the remote computer. So speed is often an issue uh, when people are transferring data, especially if they've got large amounts of data, you don't want it to take forever. Uh, certain tools have an inherently slower or faster speed of transferring the data. And some tools allow you to copy uh, parts of the data in parallel. That's a, a way to really speed things up. So we'll, we'll talk about which tools provide those options. Uh, I'm calling the next priority uh, utilities. Often you'll want to do more than just copy data back and forth. You might want to be able to list the data that's on the remote system or, or make a directory there or delete something that exists on that remote system. Not all tools provide these additional utilities. They, some tools are simply copying. Um, verification that your data transfer has worked correctly is important on occasion. You can generally rely on the modern internet and com computer infrastructure to, uh, to copy your data accurately, but uh, the best way to check that it has indeed been cor uh, correctly copied is to calculate what is called a checksum on the local computer's copy of the data, and then calculate that same value 
on the remote computer's copy of the data and compare those two checksums. And if they're the same, it's very, very likely that the data transfer was successful. So some tools will allow this option uh, and others, others do not. Sometimes it doesn't matter if you, if you were to find out later that uh, the data wasn't copied successfully, you could simply copy it again. But if you're copying it to an archive where you're gonna forget about it and hope that it just stays there forever, then you'll wanna verify that that transfer was successful. Uh, recovery would allow you to continue transferring if a transfer got interrupted. So if you had a, a 500 gigabyte file and halfway through its transfer, the internet went down, the power went out or something, um, you'd rather not have to start over from the beginning. You'd love to be able to pick up with the second 250 gigabytes of that file. And some tools allow you to do this, um, and many do not. Um, syncing is a feature that we were mentioning in the previous slide, as it's sometimes uh, the case that you want to establish two cloned copies of the same data on, on, on the local and the remote systems. And some, some tools make this easy. Uh, one of the benefits of performing a syncing operation is that you're only copying the data that uh, is not on the destination computer. So you can often wind up copying less data uh, to get the job done. Uh, next is uh, cloud storage. So we mentioned that one of the workflows that people sometimes have is to copy data to cloud storage for archiving purposes. Not all tools can talk to the cloud storage providers. So if that is your goal, you'll need to pick a tool that can. And then finally um, is the ease of use of the tool. And you could break that down into two categories. One is how much setup work is it? is required to even be able to use the tool. And then on the other end is how easy is it to, to tell the tool what you want to do and to, to see the progress that it's making. A lot of these tools um, are sort of, they're Linux tools that you execute by running a command line program. But uh, for many people, using a graphical user interface is an easier way to work. They can see everything. They don't have to remember the options. And there's no, there's no shame in this. Um, I personally use the graphical interface when it's available to me. So we'll talk about which tools can do that for you. So a little more on the topic of security here. Uh, a, a common way to tell the remote server in a data transfer that you have the right to be doing a transfer with it is by providing a password for your account. Um, that works on some systems, but it doesn't work on all systems. Sometimes you need to provide uh, the private key. You have to have a, a key pair, a secure shell SSH key pair, uh, and uh, you keep the private key for that key pair on your local computer and install the public key on the remote computer. And then when you use the tool, the data transfer tool, you tell it, I have a key pair. Uh, and you tell the, the, on your own computer, you tell it where the private part of the key is. And when it talks to the server, uh, the remote system, the remote system uses its public part of the key and they can encrypt data and send it back and forth and uh, confirm that you are who you say you are and allow you to have access. Um, I don't know how many of you have worked on Linux computers and if you have, whether you've used SSH key pairs before, but I highly encourage everyone to learn about these because they're they're going to be more and more a part of uh, working with uh, research computing, especially on Linux systems. And uh, it's good to have a basic understanding of them and to be able to use them if possible, because sometimes it will be necessary. There, there are some instances like uh, when you have a cloud instance, a, a virtual computer running in the cloud, often those computers are not created with um, the ability to let you log in with the password. You have to use an SSH key pair. So um, I'm encouraging you to look for documentation online. And I have a recommendation here at the bottom for a site that has a lot of good information, ssh.com, to, to learn about these, uh, these key pairs. I think I, I skipped over the stuff at the top here. Uh, 
the uh, the problem with the old data transfer tools, and there there are some that I'm not talking about because they're not secure, is that they um, they used to just send your password in plain text uh, across the internet, and if anyone was sort of watching the the transfer of that information, they could grab that and and then log on as you, and and that's that's really not acceptable in these modern times. So uh, I'm not going to talk about those tools except to say don't use these. Uh, so we're not quite done talking about uh, the key pairs, but for now that's uh, my introduction. And um, as I mentioned before, in order to perform a data transfer between a local computer and a remote computer, you need to have an account on both computers. Obviously, if you have, if you if one of the two computers, the local one is is your personal computer, then you do have an account there. But um, the uh, the system computer, the the remote computer that you're copying data to, data to, may not have an account activated for you. So you might have to contact a system administrator. It's also possible that either your personal computer or the system computer does not have the software installed to perform these transfers. And so you might need to make a request to have that software installed. I'll try to give you an idea as we talk about each tool, whether you're likely to find it installed or whether it's likely to need to be installed. And, and sometimes you can install them yourself, these tools yourself, if you, if you have the right permissions on the computer. So um, this, uh, these letters, SSH, I, in the previous page, I, I used them to refer to a key pair. Uh, they're also, the, it's also the name of a program the SSH program uh, lets you log into another computer, uh, usually from one Linux com computer to another. Some people also use it as a verb. Uh, they, you might have a systems person tell you to SSH into the computer, meaning use that command to log into the computer. All right, so I, uh, I covered a lot of stuff there. Um, I don't know if there have been any questions or if Steve has any uh, any reason to interrupt here, Steve? Uh, no questions at this point, but okay, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, great. Well, let's get on to the tools. So here's what I'm going to do. I have a table here that we're going to fill in as we go through the talk. The uh, the left side shows those priorities that we talked about, and across the top are the five tools we'll be discussing. And they are SCP, RSync, SFTP, RClone, and Globus. Now, hopefully, by the end, you'll be able to see which tools have which strengths in the table. Okay, so SCP, kind of an acronym for Secure Copy. Uh, it was introduced in 1995, and it's very much like an older tool called RCP. It's been around since 1982, RCP meaning remote copy, but that tool was insecure. Uh, you just you could only uh, initiate a transfer by giving your password, and it was not encrypted. So SCP is uh, uses the SSH protocol to encrypt your credentials and the files that you're sending. Uh, so if the if the remote computer allows you to connect with a password, you can do that, but you might also want to or need to uh, provide your private key from your SSH key pair in order to use SCP. SCP is really, in my view at least, the, the go-to command line tool for performing simple transfers. And I think everyone should, should know how to use it because in a pinch, uh, there's, there's a lot of good things about it. It's, it's installed on almost all systems computers, Linux computers, it's available on Macs, yeah, and uh, it's installed by default on Windows as well, though it, it may need to be enabled. Uh, sometimes on, on Windows systems, it, even though it's installed, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not made available to you until you, until you click a, um, an option somewhere to, to turn it on. So if you try to use SSH on Windows and you can't, it doesn't work. Uh, Google for enable SSH windows and, and you'll find out steps you need to perform to uh, 
to enable it. And that's this is great that on almost every computer there's this baseline uh, suite of tools. Uh, the SSH command, the SCP command are going to be available almost everywhere. And so uh, using SCP is, is uh, it, if you learn this, you'll always have something you can turn to if you need to make a transfer. So th those are its strengths. It's, it's widely available. And in fact, it's very easy to use. I'll give you some examples. And there is a uh, there is a graphical user interface available for it. If you're on a Windows computer, you can run this tool. We'll look at a little bit about that later. Um, I would say, as its weaknesses, uh, it doesn't do anything except for copy data. That's the main weakness. Uh, you can't. It doesn't have utilities to let you list out the things on the other computer or delete things. And uh, I have I have noted here that it's slow. Now. That's a little bit unfair because slow is really the norm for these data transfers. Uh, these data transfers that, that do the encrypting are gonna be doing a little extra work uh, that's gonna slow down the, the process. So slow isn't, isn't a negative thing so much as it's sort of like a baseline. So what does an SCP command look like? Well, if, you've, if you know Linux at all and you've used the CP command to copy a file or a folder, it's very similar in its syntax. So the SCP command can be followed by some options, and then you specify the source of the data and the target of the data. Now, when you're on a Linux computer using the CP command, the source could be a file or a folder, and the target could be a file or a folder, but those are assumed to be on the computer that you're working on. With SCP, either, either the source or the target could be a, a remote location. And those take the form of uh, possibly a username with an at sign after it, followed by the computer name, and then a colon, and then a path to a location on that computer. So if you don't provide the username and the at sign at the beginning, then the SCP command will attempt to perform the transfer using the username that you have on the, the computer that you're where you're running the command. This works pretty well if you're in a network of systems that all share the same usernames, because your username is likely to be the same. But uh, for example, for me, when I'm copying from uh, one of the main campus Cornell computers to uh, a computer at Weill, uh, the computers at Weill use a different username for me than, than the computers here at, on the main campus. So I need to specify the username that I want to, to uh, whose credentials I want to use on the remote computer. Um, the identification of the computer could be a uh, computer.cornell.edu uh, type address, or it could be an IP address, the series of four numbers that specify where the computer is. That's often something you might need to do if you're talking to a cloud instance uh, that doesn't have a a nice domain name associated with it. The colon is very important to include in this command here. The colon is what tells the SCP command that this source or target is at a remote location. If you, if you don't have the colon, it thinks it's just a, a very fancy name of a local file or folder. And so you could wind up copying your source right back to your same computer if you've forgotten to put the the colon there and it'll give it a really weird file name and you'll go what, what's that doing here and so keep that in mind you need the colon and and if you if you don't put anything after the colon the data that's copied to that location will be placed in the home directory of the user that is that is uh, either specified in the command or or you the user um, that is running the command uh, you are able to specify any path on the computer, like you could start with a slash and then, and then have some folder hierarchy after that. Of course, the, the location that you eventually end up with in that path has to be a folder that you have permissions to write to or to read from. That's the other thing that not only do you need to be able to, to log into this computer, you have to have credentials, but you're only then able to access files 
for which you have the appropriate permissions. It's a lot of information. I hope that wasn't too much. Let's go for a simpler example here. So if we would just want to copy a file from our, our home computer, let's say, to a computer uh, on the network, uh, the file in this example is called file.txt. So I say a CP file.txt. And then I give the name of the computer I want to go to and the colon at the end of it. So this is going to put file.txt in the home directory of the user for this copy operation. And since I didn't specify a user uh, in the target, in the, in the destination, uh, it's going to be trying to use my current credentials, my current login name. Uh, if what this command will do when you run it is it's going to prompt you for the password on the remote system. Uh, and you give that password, it gets encrypted and sent over and then it's checked. And if, it, if it's correct, if you have these, the right permissions, then the file will get copied over and you'll, you'll get a little feedback uh, showing that that file has been copied over. If you had 15 files that ended with .txt, you could say scp star .txt, copy all of the .txt files over, and you would get some feedback as each of those files was being copied. So if we turn this process around and go the other direction, you can see that uh, in the second example here, uh, scp computer.med.cornell.edu colon file.txt, the file that we just copied over there in the previous example, space, period. Uh, the period means in the context of the local computer, the current directory that I'm in. So this would copy the file from the home directory on the other computer back to the directory that I'm currently in. And once again, uh, you would be prompted to provide your password. Even if you had just given the password before for the previous command, this, this is a whole new command and uh, it's gonna ask you again. And then this time it's checking to see, do you have the permissions to to uh, read that file. A few more examples for SCP, because uh, sometimes you're not gonna wanna copy just a single file or a file name with wildcards in it. You're gonna wanna copy directories or files to directories. So in this first example, the um, SCP file.txt to the computer colon directory is going to try to copy the file, file.txt, into a directory, in this case named directory, in, that's within the user's home directory. That folder has to exist. It's not, the SCP command is not going to make it for you during this copy. And, and the second line is an example of how you could specify a path to some other location on that remote computer, as long as you have permission to write to it. Uh, most Linux computers have a slash temp folder on them where you can put files that are not expected to live very long. So sometimes you can copy to that location. This is mainly meant to be an illustration of how you would do it. I'm not saying that you can do all of these things uh, yourself. So if, however, you want to actually copy a directory to the to the remote computer or back from the remote computer, you're going to need to include the minus R option to specify that the copy should be recursive. So that means it will take the direct, it'll create the directory and anything that's in it, including subdirectories and anything that's inside them recursively all the way down the folder tree. So this is different than the previous example. Uh, the, the directory does not need to exist on the other computer. You're going to be creating it by copying the data. If it does happen to exist, then any, any contents within it will just be copied into that location, overwriting anything that might be there already. So I was going on and on earlier about how wonderful SSH keys are. You can use SSH keys when you give your, when you issue SCP commands. And in this case, the the command will not prompt you to give your password. If you've given a valid key file, it will be satisfied and it will just go ahead and perform the copy. So the option you, you, you use for this is to say minus I and then the path to your key file, minus I for identification. Um, 
this is the uh, private key that is on your local computer. And the matching public key has to already be on the other computer. So this is one of those cases where if you want to do this, you need to do a little setup work. You need to copy that, um, the contents at least of that public key over to the other computer and place it in a specific location. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but if you if you look it up on the ssh.com uh, link that I showed earlier, there'll be a full explanation of, of how and why this needs to be done. Because uh, the key pairs have to match the local key that's private and the and the uh, public key on the on the uh, remote system have to be from the same pair. Now there's a there's an even deeper level of uh, convenience available here. If you put your private key in a file in your home directory under the dot a dot ssh folder and you put it into a file called id underscore rsa the scp command will know to look for that file. Uh, and if it finds it, it will assume that that is the private key you want to use. And then you won't even have to specify this minus I key file option, and you won't have to give a password. So that's how I like to have things set up when I'm working between two computers, and I know I'm going to be doing it over and over again. I'll, I'll get this all set up so that I can just say, copy from here to there, and it doesn't, it doesn't bother me, and it's still secure. Now, I will admit that sometimes when you first try to use SCP or, or the SSH command for that matter, um, it doesn't always work because something is not right. It often it has to do with your keys. Um, if you're ever in that situation, I want you to be aware of the minus V option, which stands for verbose. And uh, if you run the command, it, it will spit out a bunch of diagnostic information that can be helpful to you or to a systems person who's trying to help you. Um, it, Somewhere in all of that text output may be the explanation for what went wrong and uh, what you need to change in order to get the SCP command to work correctly. Um, so let's look at pause here for a moment. Yeah, uh, I can. Question in the chat that I think uh, the, uh, somebody wants to know if the SCP with the SSH key will require authentication from Duo. That. Um, that I would say depends on the computer system that you're connecting to. Uh, I I believe I have uh, connected to a system that does eventually prompt you after it accepts either your password or the key file. If it wants a dual factor authentication, it will give you a prompt saying, um, "Give me a, a, a text message or or use Duo, send me a push, and then you'll enter." which of those things you'd like it to do. And then on your phone, you can perform that dual factor authentication. Right, that makes sense because this is all based on SSH, which would do that very same thing, I think. Um, I'd also like to just point out that the tilde in that path, maybe people aren't familiar with that, that's an abbreviation for your home directory in Linux. Yeah, uh, we had hoped to talk first uh, in the series of talks about some Linux uh, background information, and we uh, the schedule didn't work out that way. But you will eventually have an opportunity to catch up on that kind of information. Thank you. Yeah, that that will be my talk in a month and a half. <laughs> so stay tuned. Um, also, there's a question about Windows. Um, but I guess we're going to get to some of the GUI clients. I think that for using SCP in the way you're talking about, you would have to use a command shell on Windows. Is that right? That's right. I sort of glossed over that. So if you're on Windows, you can open up the CMD, the command program, or you can uh, use PowerShell if you're a PowerShell user. Or you, um, and then you can issue the SCP command uh, on the command line there. And uh, if you're on a Mac, you would run the terminal program, which opens up a, uh, a shell where you can issue these commands. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Thanks for the people in the chat yeah, talking to about the answers here. Okay. So here's, uh, here's our first update for the table. Um, what's good about SCP? Well, the SSH service is going to be installed almost on, I would say, on every um, system that you'll be working with for research purposes. It's a very basic thing. Uh, and in fact, the... the um, the client is 
going to be installed on most computers as well. So you're, the tool is probably already on your computer. It's easy to use because it doesn't do very much. Uh, and as I said earlier, the fact that it's slow, has a slow transfer speed is not really a knock against it. And there is, a, there is one GUI program that can use the SCP protocol to perform copies. I will say that uh, if you're going to be using a GUI, um, we'll talk about later how the SFTP protocol is the one that's used more often at, to, to greater benefit. So I'm not going to uh, encourage you to jump on Win SCP right now, even though I, I use it myself and find it to, be, or to work just fine. I think when I'm using it, it's actually using it uh, in the SFTP category. So we'll talk about it after we get to that. So let's move on to rsync. rsync obviously is, well, not obviously, but it, it is, it's newer than SCP, came out in uh, around 1996. I guess you can tell it's newer because it has an icon, a little bit of branding up there, uh, although that that is a very 90s looking branding, I have to say. So this, this allows you to issue commands on the command line that look very much like SCP commands, but in addition to copying, they, they can also do a syncing operation. In fact, I believe it, it's their default. So it'll, it'll save you time if some of what you want to copy from the source is already on the destination. It'll only copy those things that don't exist already on the destination or are, have been changed on the source, are newer. Um, so uh, this is a tool that, that I use right now still, even though it's old as the hills, uh, it, uh, it's still got very good value for copying data um, between systems. It's not going to be installed on as many computers as SSH is. And in fact, you need both SSH and uh, rsync installed to use rsync. But the Linux systems typically will have it installed. Uh, apparently, my note here says that it's also typically installed on Mac systems, but you won't find it on Windows. So if you have a Windows computer and you want to use rsync, you have to be prepared to install it. Uh, and that link is the place to start. Uh, so in addition to having the sync capability, uh, rsync is also able to uh, perform the verifications of the data that it copies with the calculating the checksums and comparing them. And it's also able to recover from copies that were interrupted. I found those options to be a little fussy to use. For instance, if you if you want it to be able to um, recover from interrupted copies, you have to tell it that when you're making your first copy, uh, your first attempt at the copy, saying if this fails, I want you to remember where it was, and then the next time you say now, t you know, uh, take over from where it uh, got interrupted. It's not as easy as saying whoops, something didn't work. Uh, just keep going from where it got interrupted. It it needs to be told that that's something you care about. And uh, it does have a graphical user interface. I was not impressed when I looked at it. So I'm simply noting that it exists. Uh, I wouldn't, I, I, I didn't even try it. I, I'm not going to recommend it. So I guess I've already said some of these things about well, what, what exactly is syncing? Syncing, um, again, uh, is copying only the source files that do not already exist on the destination or that have changed since the ones that that are newer than the ones on the on the uh, destination system. Usually, this is determined based on the last modification date of the file. Uh, there are some other means of determining what is what is different. So uh, the tool has a bunch of options that let you specify these different things. If you really want to keep two folders absolutely in sync, then copying from Computer A to, to computer B does not actually achieve that because there might be some files on computer B that uh, aren't on computer A. So you would need to run the sync command going in the opposite direction, which would bring over those things that were not on the on the first computer. I'm sorry, I skipped over a line here. Uh, one of the things you can tell rsync to do when it's um, when it's performing a, a syncing operation is if if you want, uh, you can have it delete files on the destination that were not on the source. 
uh, by default, it's not going to do that. But this this would cause the two folders to be nearly identical after the after just the first copy, because it would get rid of things on the other system that you don't have on on your local system. But you would you may still have things that are newer on the destination than they were on the source. Anyway, uh, it's the kind of tool that you, you need to experiment with a little bit to get a good feel for, uh, for what exactly it does. And in fact, um, some of the tutorials I've seen give you like a little sample data set that you should create. And, and then when you uh, go through the tutorial, you'll see how it, uh, what it chooses to overwrite or delete. And, uh, and you'll get a good feel for it from that. So this is a, uh, this is another tool I would recommend if you're if you think you need syncing. So there are uh, I'm just going to mention a few of the options that you would give. It, as I said, the rsync command looks a lot like the SCP command, where you say rsync and then your options and then your source and your destination. Uh, again, uh, minus R is the option you specify when you want to operate recursively on folders. Because it's so complicated and you might not get your options correct, it has a, what it's called a dry run feature. So if you specify the minus NV option, it will tell you everything it would do if you let it do it. Uh, so after you see that that looks good, then you can do it for real. Um, and it has another option, I guess I just should have mentioned this earlier, it can perform compression of the data before it copies it. Uh, and that, that will save on the transfer time because it'll be transferring less data. Um, I'm going to skip over the exclude and include options. They let you uh, filter a bit about uh, what, what you're copying. I see I'm running behind here. So I'm going to, uh, going to keep moving. As I said, uh, rsync verifies the transferred files. And uh, and it can resume partial interrupted transmissions. So this is what its uh, happy happy chart looks like here. The green stuff is new things that uh, SCP did not do. But it's a little bit of a harder tool to to learn because it has so many options. And uh, so I think that's a fair assessment. Steve, is there anything I can talk about? We're good. Proceed. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Now, SFTP stands for Secure File Transfer Protocol, and this is newer still, came out in 2001, and it's a secure version of a very, very old tool, FTP, File Transfer Protocol, which has been around since, wow, 1971. Um, so this, is, this tool uses a different paradigm than the two we've talked before, talked about before. Those tools, you would say, essentially copy this to that, and that was it. You'd run the tool and it would copy this to that, and it would be done. SFTP opens up a connection between your local computer and the remote computer, and it allows you to issue a sequence of commands, whatever sequence you would like, while that connection exists. So you can put files from your computer, you can get files from the remote computer. When you're done, you quit and close the connection. But in addition to those copying commands, you can, you can do things on the remote computer. You could change the directory that you're in and list out its contents. If you look at the, the second line here that starts with, uh, in the middle of the, the outline, it starts with PWD for print working directory, there's a bunch of commands that are familiar to those who are Linux users that you can execute on the remote computer to uh, make directories, remove them, rename files, change permissions, uh, and list out the contents. And then there's actually a couple of versions of those commands that you can execute on your local computer while you're within the SFTP connection. So LLS is a local LS, list out the local files. Uh, LCD is change my local directory, and LPWD is print out my current local working directory. Uh, SFTP uh, is able to uh, resume from an interrupted copy. And now we're getting to the good stuff. There are several very nice and free graphical user interface programs that work with SFTP. So I've already mentioned WinSCP, but FileZilla and CyberDuck are very popular tools. And um, I'll talk about them in a moment. 
this is an example of a, a little SFTP session. So imagine on the local computer that I've got uh, a couple files of type PDF. So I start my SFTP session by saying SFTP to my username at and then server.organization.org. And let's assume I have my SSH key in place. So it doesn't even have to ask me for uh, a password. Uh, and then I get this SFTP greater than sign prompt. This I'm now in the SFTP connection between the local and remote computer. And I can start issuing my SFTP command. And the first command I do is I, I make a directory called PDFs. And then I issue uh, these commands that I'm actually issuing are in orange. Uh, I say put star.pdf, all the local files that end in .pdf, put them into that PDFs folder. And then I get some feedback while those operations are happening. So, uh, progress uh, indicators here. And you can see there were three files. There's foo.pdf, rgb, plot.pdf, and subplots.pdf. And when that command ends, I issue another command, cd, into that PDFs folder. And then I say ls to list out the contents of that folder that I've just changed into. And sure enough, there are the three files that I just copied over. And then I can quit the session. So this is nice. Um, sometimes you want to do a little housekeeping while you're copying data. You want to remove old things or rename something so you can copy something else with the same name, like make the old one, the old, the previous version of it, uh, give it a name that indicates that and then copy over the new version. Uh, and you can copy things in both directions, all within this, this little environment here. So I, I think this is a great way to go. And uh, let's see. So what do, we, what do we have that's new here? It's, we're back to just requiring the SSH service on the remote computer. That's good. We now have these, this ability to do other things, the utilities. And we have recovery ability. And we've got these, um, we've got these GUI interfaces. And that's what I'll talk about next. Uh, Steve, anything? Yeah, so um, we, you've mentioned for RSync and FT SFTP that they can resume uh, an interrupted transfer. Um, is user intervention required to resume that or do they do it automatically? Um, I don't want to be too definitive about that. I believe with RSync, you do need to, you, you need to issue the, the command again. And if you, if the first time you ran the command, you told it, you know, keep track of where you are in case something goes wrong. And when you run it the second time, it will be able to notice that and, and keep and, uh, and recover. I don't believe you need to do that with SFTP. I think that it happens more automatically. Yeah, so for one, you need to have intervention. I guess you would need to enter your password again, if that's, if you're trying to- Well, it, you would issue the command in the same way as before oh, if, right. if you need to provide credentials. It's just that um, it would know to look to see if there was an interrupted uh, transfer that it could resume. But it doesn't it doesn't try it itself. And I'm, I'm going to make that point because uh, it, in one of the tools we'll talk about later, it does. It does it for you. You don't have to ask. It just says, I'm going to keep trying to do this. But rsync is not that tool. Yeah, yeah. OK, and then. Uh... The question about uh, command line tools, if there is an advantage to command line over drag and drop? Well, the big, the big advantage is that most of the uh, research systems you might be logged on to do not run a graphical desktop. There's no way that you can, um, you can run one of these GUI tools on that computer and see the, see the GUI interface. Uh, if you're working from your own computer to one of those computers, then uh, then you really do have the choice. But sometimes when you want to transfer between two Linux systems and they're they're really hardcore computing systems, they don't they're not going to have these graphical interfaces on them. So you you can't use the graphical tool in all situations, and that's why I think it's still important to learn the the, the command line version of some of these lower ones lower level tools. Yeah, I guess we get a peek at some of the GUIs next, right? We do. Okay. All right. Let's do that. So here's a here's a list. There are a lot of tools available that uh, provide graphical user interfaces for data transfers. But I'm cheap, and so my eye is always drawn to the free ones. And so these are the three that are free and 
uh, long-standing, well-established tools. WinSCP, which only runs on Windows, uh, and at the bottom is Cyberduck, which runs on Windows and Mac. Both of those are free. And then there's FileZilla, which has a, uh, a uh, free version and a pro version, which isn't that expensive, actually, $20. Uh, and they work on, that works on all three types of operating systems. Um, I'm not, so as I was saying earlier, the SCP column, uh, after the price column there, that doesn't concern me that much. I would be connecting with the SFTP version because that's going to give you all these abilities to list out the files and uh, delete files and things on the uh, other computer. Now, uh, WinSCP says that it allows you to connect to AWS S3 storage for free. I haven't tried it. I'll take them at the word. Uh, Cyberduck says that not only can it do that, but it can talk to Google Drive and, Cla and Google Cloud, uh, Microsoft OneDrive and Azure, Box and Dropbox. That's, that's really handy. Uh, and to get that functionality with FileZilla, you would need to get their pro version. But at least you could try out the, the SFTP part of their uh, functionality before you decided to buy the, the pro version. Let's, let's just take a quick look at what, what a user interface like this might look at. First, I'll have to acknowledge it's pretty busy. There's a lot going on here. Um, but working from the top down, you'll see that um, there's a place where it's showing you what remote computer you're connected to. The host, uh, in this case, it's a, an IP address, the username, the password. And at the far end of the right side of that line here near the top, it says Quick Connect. This is a, a feature that a tool like this will have where it can save for you a bunch of sets of credentials and computers you want to connect to. So you can just go to that drop down menu and pick the computer you want to connect to, and it, it will send the credentials that you saved with it. Uh, the, the first white panel here is showing like the low level output of the commands it's actually issuing, the, the SFTP commands. Uh, so that can help you see if something's going wrong. Everything's green and, and happy right now in this example. The, the split panel that's below it shows on the left side the folder hierarchy of your local computer and on the right side the hierarchy of the remote computer and it shows the uh, currently selected directory, the directory that you're in. In this case, they're working with uh, some icons or something. So the 16 by 16 size is what this person seems to care about. And then for the selected uh, folder below it, you can see a listing of all the files in the folder. So it hasn't waited for you to say, I want to do an LS, I want to uh, uh, see what the files are. It's gone ahead and done that for you just to, to show you a little more information. Uh, and if you ever click on a different folder in the folder tree, it will do the CD command for you. Um, and it will change the contents in the, in the listing. So it's using the underlying SFTP, but you don't have to worry about every little thing. You just, it's like you're in a, um, in a Windows Explorer or something like that. Now it's, a, it's adding a little more value to that. If you see the, the file compared at PNG is highlighted in red. That is an indication that it's changed. It's, uh, if you look at the size, the file size column, it's bigger on the local computer than it is on the remote computer. So this is a visual cue to you that maybe this is a file you wanna do something with. And the yellow ones are ones that uh, don't exist on the other computer. It's just calling your attention to those things. Uh, and they have a little example here of a context menu uh, that, you can, that you can open up to uh, specify actions you'd like to take, like copy this from this side to the other side. And then at the very bottom, you'll see there's a couple progress bars for files that are being copied at once. And this should suggest to you that this tool, the graphical user interface, is providing a parallelized version of SFTP. You can queue up multiple jobs and, and it will run them at the same time and manage them for you. Even though SFTP only lets you copy one thing at a time, this tool has added value to that by adding in that parallelism. So there's more to these tools than just being easy. They can do things that uh, uh, the, the logic for which was not in the original SFTP protocol. Any questions about the GUIs? All right, I'm gonna see if we can 
get to the end here. Next is our clone. I love our clone. So if you've looked at the chart for all the things that were good about the previous three tools, our clone checks all those boxes. You can copy files and folders like SCP. You can do syncing and verification like you can with rsync. You can do some management things like listing and deleting and making directories like you could with SFTP. Uh, and it, provide, it performs copies in parallel threads for faster operation. It also works with cloud storage providers. It's, it's one ring to rule them all. I love it. So uh, what's wrong with it? Well, it's not going to be installed on a lot of computers that you, that you go to. So this is a case where you have to say, I see the value of this, and it's worth the time it will take to, uh, to set it up. So what you need to do is make sure the software is installed on the client computer. You don't need to have it installed on the, any of the target computers. Um, and then for every remote computer you want to work with, you have to configure what our clone calls a remote. It could be uh, another computer. It could be uh, a cloud storage. Uh, whatever information our clone needs has to be included in this configuration whatever information it needs to be able to talk to it. So if it's a remote system, it will want to know your, uh, your login and either your password or your SSH key. If it's a, if it's a AWS S3, it wants to know what bucket it is uh, and uh, what your uh, access keys are. So you have, to, you have to configure, but once you've done that, things are a lot easier. Like um, if you're copying a file uh, from your local computer to uh, to another computer, you're not going to have to specify your password or your key because that's included in the specification of the remote. So every target or source is uh, identified just as a remote name, which is part of your configuration colon, and then the path to the to where the data is coming from or going to. Uh, and, and if you don't include that remote part and the colon, then it then you're talking about a local file. Our clone will understand that, very similar to what SCP used the colon for. So um, one thing that's a little different from some of the other tools is that our clone assumes when you're talking with, when you're working with folders, that it's to copy them recursively. That's the default behavior. You'd have to tell it to not do that if you don't want it to. Of course, it's kind of meaningless to copy just a folder that's empty. but. Uh, so here's some sample commands. Um, uh, when you run the tool, you're running our clone, but since it, since it can do so many things, you need to then give a subcommand name after it. And in these three examples here, the first one is a copy command, copying the file.txt to the remote computer. Uh, the second one is ls. I want to L list out the contents of the test folder on the remote computer. And the, and the third one is delete. So I'm going to delete file. These three are sort of a sequence. I'm copying this file over to uh, a test folder, then I'm listing out the test folder, and then I'm deleting the file that I that I copied there. I, I'm sorry that there isn't enough time in this talk to, to go into a lot of detail on all these different tools. I just want you to understand what they can do for you, and, and you have to be prepared maybe to, to spend some time learning about them yourself. So uh, as I move on here, I'll uh, look at all the glorious green in the R clone column. It, it isn't faster in the individual transfers it's performing because it's still using SSH to copy the files. But since it provides the parallelism, it can be a lot faster uh, in, the, in the end. Uh, and, and, and there is an experimental web interface for it. I have not tried to use that. I was dis discouraged when, I, when their documentation for it did not show a single screenshot. I thought, well, yeah, that must be pretty bad if they don't even want to show it to you. So I didn't bother. Uh, I won't recommend that. Steve, anything? Uh, mm, yeah, not necessarily. Keep going. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to rush, rush. Okay, we're getting to the end of the line here. Uh, Globus. Globus is, and I'll just, I'll just read this, it's a nonprofit data transfer service for researchers. So this is meant this was designed for people doing heavy duty research, moving lots of data um, between computers at research institutions like uh, educational institutions, not for profits. And it does everything. 
It's, uh, it's easy to use. It's fast. It works in parallel. Uh, fault tolerance, that this is the tool I was alluding to earlier. It just tries again to make your data copy work. You don't have to tell it to. It'll try it a number of times before it gives up. And it can work with cloud storage. So you access it through a web interface. There is a command line interface, but really the web interface is, is great. And one of the nice things about it is you can use it from anywhere and um, specify the copy operations that you want to have happen. And they'll just be running in the background. You can log off and walk away. Um, so you don't have to be at your computer or with one of the computers where your data is in order to copy data from or to that computer. These are called third-party transfers. When you're on a third machine, specifying a copy of data between two other machines. Um, the, big, the big restriction on Globus is that it only works between servers that are set up running what are called Glo Globus endpoints. It, there has to be a Globus server running on the two computers that the copy is going in between. And, and uh, there aren't that many computers that are running Globus servers. In fact, even the nonprofit institutions that that use it have to subscribe to a service. They have to pay tens of thousands of dollars annually to have this service running. So um, there is some limit to, to uh, the availability of it. Now, an individual can put up a server on, uh, on another computer, but it's, it's often limited in what it can do. Uh, so the good news is, which is on the next page, uh, first of all, I'll point out that I have uh, uh, there's a link here to a whole topic describing how you could use Globus. Uh, it's part of our CAC's online uh, tutorials. The good news is Cornell has Globus servers. So if you're part of Cornell, there are, there's a server, there's a, an endpoint here at the Center for Advanced Computing. It's We call it the archive endpoint. It's intended to be a place where you could store data long term. Uh, and then uh, at Weill Cornell Medicine, there's an SCU endpoint. And I don't have details on uh, who's welcome to use these and then what contributions they might need to make. But uh, if you want more information, there is a link. I don't have these links uh, shown again, so take a picture of this page if, you, if you're if you interested. If you have questions, you just want more information, at either of these locations, you can open a help ticket and someone will talk to you about what is available, what your options are what you need to do. So I'm going to, oh, this is a picture of the Globus web interface. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a like formally like that the, uh, the GUI that we looked at before, the left side is one location and the right side is the other. You can pick what endpoint you're um, connected to in each of those sides, and then you can change directories within that endpoint. And then you can select files down at the bottom and, and click a, the start button that you see that's highlighted in the, in the left and say, transfer this from this side to that side. And it fires it off. And when it's done, you'll find out about it. Um, it's, it's very easy to use. Uh, down the center, there are a couple things there. If you can read the icons, there's like a new folder. To create a new folder. You can change the name of something. You can delete something, download something to your current computer, upload something from your current computer. So it's got, it's got a wonderful set of utilities there within this interface. So there's our final column. Globus ticks all the boxes pretty much, except that it needs to have two, two Globus endpoints to work. So you, uh, if that is not a hindrance to you, it's a great tool. Great, great for copying large amounts of data, very fast. So um, yeah, since we're way over here, I'm going to just uh, give you a Summary of my recommendations, uh, don't use RCP and FTP. They, they may still be around on some computer, but they're just not safe. If you only want to copy a few files between computers and you don't want to do any setup work, use SCP I, and learn it, learn it so that it's always a, a tool in your toolbox there. If you want to keep the contents of folders on to different computers in sync over a period of time, let's say, right, you know, repeated operation of syncing them up, and you don't mind doing a little bit of setup work, rsync is a good tool for you. 
SFTP is great if you want to do a little bit more than just copying files, if you want to manage the files, renaming and deleting and so forth. Or if you prefer to use a graphical user interface to do your work, SFTP is the protocol that really provides that. Our clone is, is a great tool if you're doing command line, uh, sort of power user type uh, data transfers. Uh, you need to do some setup for every different computer that you're going to be copying to, but uh, th then it's it's quite easy to use after that. So, um, and it also it speeds things up by using parallelism, like you can copy a couple files at a time, and you don't have to tell it, you don't have to be fussy with it. You can you can tweak it if you want, but it right out of the box it does the smart thing. And of course, Globus is is just like a super powerful. For, uh, but limited in the use that it, you have to bring your data to an endpoint uh, in order to be able to use it. But if you're working with some other uh, academic nonprofit organizations that also use Globus, it's a great way to share your data between those two organizations. Um, really quickly, if you have a lot of small files, don't copy them one at a time. Uh, archive them, put them together into one large archive using a program like TAR, zip them up. Uh, there's an overhead involved in every different file copy. And so if you can reduce the number of files, you reduce that overhead. If you have a file that can be compressed, if when you run a program like gzip on it and it gets smaller, uh, substantially smaller, then that would be a good thing to include in your data transfer um, workflow. Yeah, you have to uncompress it once it gets to the destination, but you could save a lot of time during the copying. And if you're archiving it, you don't care, you know, you don't want to uncompress it. You'll be spending less money to store the smaller file. So uh, compressing is good too. And as we mentioned several times, syncing can save you time because it doesn't copy things that don't need to be copied. And if you can use a tool that provides parallelism, it can make up for the sort of slow nature of data transfers. So here's the here's the slide where you can see all the uh, all the links if you want to take a picture of this. Any questions, Steve? Um, no, no further questions. Um, I, well, thank I you, Steve. I one for, myself, uh, but oh, you do. Well, I just thought it would be good to mention that there is another protocol called SMB, which lets you mount a remote drive as if it's on your desktop, and you can drag and drop. And Windows and Mac. The problem is that's also the hardest to set up. <laughs> it needs the most permissions over the network and on the remote server. So um, only use it if your remote system, you know that you can use it and you have instructions, but there are ways you can do that. Thank you, Steve, for handling all the questions and thank you all for coming.